Good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you're joining us from. My name is Dr. Jemima Kareki. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist and the CEO and founder of Wills for Life and Wills for Life Healthcare Limited. And I'm really excited to have you here today on our YouTube channel, Wills for Life by Dr. Jemima Karibuni Sana. The topic of the day is fibroids a very asked question and today we are going to be tackling everything about it if you have any questions please feed them on the comment you're going to answer as soon as possible and if you haven't subscribed subscribe to the channel even as we start thank you so fibroids are benign tumors that grow from the cells of the muscles of the uterus so fibroids grow on the uterine cells and the uterus is a is a bag of muscles so any tumor coming from the uterus would be a muscular type of tumor or growth which we now call the fibroid or in the medical term leiomyoma okay they are very benign they hardly turn cancerous they only turn cancerous about three percent of the time and when they do, they can be very, very um, dramatic and need very um, keen, um, need very rapid care because they can easily, easily take one's life. But for, that is just for the 3%. Otherwise, uh, fibroids tend to be very benign and one can live with them uh, for a very long time unless they're causing us issues. So these issues are the ones that I'm going to be talking about today. So risk factors for um, fibroids. There are very many risk factors for fibroid. One, it's an estrogenic um, growth, which means that it likes being in an environment of estrogen. So if you got your menses early or if you get your menopause late, that means you have very many ears exposed to the high levels of estrogen in the female body you're likely to get fibroids if you're of the black race blacks are more predisposed to getting um, fibroids than our white community or white counterparts um the other people who are likely to get this um, disease are uh, women who do not have many children or stay a long long time before conceiving and we see it mostly between 35 to 45 years of age. So um, staying for long without conceiving or being pregnant, um, staying for very long periods with, with your normal estrogen pattern, that is early menarche and late menopause are all predisposing to getting this particular type of, um, can, of uh, growth. The other thing that is common is a high fat diet and also um, obesity. One, it's because both of them um, have a lot of fat deposition, which is translated or converted by the body to estrogens. So as I've said, it's a high estrogenic um, state and therefore we need to be very keen on how we, on how we expose our body to estrogen, okay? Things that are protective is actually a combined estrogen co um, contraceptive because it lowers the threshold of estrogen in the body. Other things that are safe are getting many children. Uh, <laughs> that's actually one of the safe things. Our pregnancy also um, allows one to reduce the estrogen content of the body. Okay. Of course, we can also talk about exercise and diet because we've had that obesity or high fat diet is um, a risk factor for um, getting fibroids. So how would you know that you have fibroids? Usually you may not know that you have fibroids. It's an incidental finding when you're going for your regular checkup that you find that um, when you do an ultrasound, we can pick that you have a a fibroid when you look at fibroids it's not really the size that matters it's really where it is so there are five places that the body or the woman's body can have fibroids you can have them next to the cervix you can have them in the body of the uterus you can have them within the endometrial cavity what you call a submucosal fibroid you can have them outside 
um, the uterine cavity, which we call the um, subserosal fibroids or a pedunculated fibroid. So some of them, um, we mean, they may not bug you much. For example, a subserosal fibroid is really outside the uterine body. But because of where it is, it can go pushing on the bladder or pushing on the ureter or pushing on the rectum so that it becomes your food. You're always constipated and you don't know why or you have um, urine symptoms and you, you're, you're not aware of the reason. So these are the things that can now cause us as doctors to come and remove. So some of the symptoms that you will note would be infertility. And I'll tell you why you would get infertility with the fibroids. Another one is recurrent pregnancy losses. Another one and the most common is bleeding. What we call abnormal uterine bleeding. Heavy bleeding with clots for more than seven days. Or just clots for the usual five to seven days and it is very painful because blood is pushing against a hard object so um that is another thing abnormal abdominal swelling your tummy just looks big or you look pregnant all the time so that could also be one of the symptoms to let us know that you have fibroids okay and then um back pain especially if it's a posterior fibroid that is quite big can also be one of the things that you can check to let you know hint at you that perhaps i may be having fibroids okay so now we have discovered you have fibroids what do we do we look at what is the what is your end goal so for example if the issue is infertility and um infertility would come because of many reasons for example if the uterus if the fibroid is within the uterus when you have a fibroid, it makes the uterus longer in terms of length of size. It also can block the lining, making it very difficult for sperm to swim up from the cervical cavity all the way up to the uterine body and into the fallopian tubes. So that could be one of the reasons that would cause us to have um, um, infertility. The others is the positioning. If it's next to the cervix, it can make you, it can make sperm not go up, forming an obstruction. Another is if it's next to the tubes, then it would also block the tube so that um, fertilization is difficult to happen because sperm travel is impeded or the egg that comes down the zygote that has been created is unable to go into the uterine body. Again, implantation becomes very difficult if you have a submucosal fibroid or you may have an implantation, but because the vessels of um, supplying the uterus are going through a lot of strain, then you have an implantation failure because of poor blood supply. So all these reasons can cause you to have difficulty conceiving and difficulty maintaining a pregnancy if you have fibroids that are around the the cervix around the tube or around the um the uterine so once we find that you have fibroids again we we discuss with you what are the treatment options okay so there are fibroids that we manage medically where we shrink the fibroid although it has a higher risk of recurrence because we block the, um, the estrogen from the brain from being um, secreted but then after a while the body is going to recover from my injection and then you end up with a refractory um, let me say refractory healing so it will grow very fast after that because the blood supply goes back and the hormones the estrogen comes back into play the second one is we can do um, thermal ablation where we come and sort of burn um the, the the blood supply to the uterus the only problem with that is if you're not done with um, your fertility or you are still trying to conceive then among the vessels that are going to be impeded are the ovarian arteries and the ovarian arteries you know are the ones who supply the follicles or the eggs that help you get your blood supply so you can see it will reduce your egg quality and it will also reduce your egg count so if you're not ready for that particular like you're not done getting babies you would avoid it for a bit okay the other one is um 
surgery. Surgery is a sure bet method of making sure that uh, you don't get that you remove all the fibroids or most of the bigger fibroids that are symptomatic, especially if they come with pressure symptoms. Um, those would be the big one, one kg, two kg, three kg, or multiple ones, which are many, 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 many. Then you you can you're able to remove them. And then now uh, the submucosal ones that give you the most headache because they give you a lot of bleeding, infertility, a recurrent pregnancy loss. The easiest way to remove them is through surgery. Surgery has two ways you can do it. You can either do um, open surgery where we actually cut the, the womb the way we do during a caesarean section. And then we go to the, to the uterus and cut and remove. Or we can do it laparoscopically, where we go in with a camera and then we use instruments to get into the peritoneal cavity and into the, the womb. And then we're able to do the cut using our instruments and remove the, the fibroids and then uh, remove them through small holes and mucilating something. It's sort of like we drill and make them smaller and bring them out of the body. Okay. The only thing that we do when if it's laparoscopically, you have to make sure you have the right size, um, which of course your doctor is going to guide you to see if you have too many or it's just one big one or the size. For example, if it's greater than 14 weeks or 16 weeks, we will not take you to through laparoscopically unless it's a highly experienced laparoscopic surgeon who would be able to do it and remove it vaginally. Okay. These are some of the things that we can do. Um, surgery, medical, other medications that I told you we can do, and then the ablation techniques, okay? So which method is right for you is going to be guided by your, your requirements. For example, if you're treating only bleeding, you have your desired fertility size, then you can go the radiological way, which is ablation. But if you are looking at infertility, you still have other children, you still really want other children then maybe surgery may be better but whichever the method you choose please remember these are they, are, they start as seedlings and then they grow they look like small potatoes and then they grow the same way a plant would grow so sometimes when you're doing whichever method we're doing whether medical or whatever this particular seedling may be missed by our eyes or our hands because it's a firm thing that we feel and we know this one has a problem then we cut and remove so these small things that siblings sometimes would keep growing um, we may miss it and then they grow afterwards so we usually tell you there's a recurrent rate after five to ten years or two to, or two to three years if you use a medication okay in those five to ten years we hope you've gotten all your children <laughs> and you're done with that bit or you've gotten into menopause if you're in the more advanced years so fibroids we tend to see them between the years of 35 to 45 so you see around that most women have either finished getting their kids or they are starting to get their children so if you have your surgery done earlier then you're able to to complete your desired family size faster okay if you've gone through a deep myomectomy which is the surgery for removal of fibroids we may not allow you to go through vaginal delivery especially if we went all the way into the lining of the uterus because that means we have created tension or um, an area of weakening in the, in the muscle of the body so that if you go through labor the contractions can cause you to to get rupture the same way that if you have a cesarean section once we'll be very hesitant to allow you to deliver again unless the healing went well and we check using scans and other things so if you've gone through a myomectomy please ask your doctor if it was a subserosal those those ones that are outside the uterine cavity those are fine, you can push without an issue. But if it was a deep cut and your doctor will tell you, then we may not allow you to have a normal delivery again. So that's something also that you should have in consideration. That said, the tests that we do before we go to um, theater to make sure that they're not cancerous, for example, you can check your LDH. Um, it is important that if we do any method, especially surgical, that it is taken to a lab so that this lab is able to confirm it was benign and not cancerous, okay? 
very important for each and everything that is removed in your body, not just fibroids, but even cysts or whatever it is. Let it be taken to a lab. Let them confirm that everything is okay. All right. So with that, I hope you have learned something about fibroids. Um, and if you have any questions, please place them in the comments. We'll be happy to answer you in a subsequent video or write in the comments. If you haven't subscribed, please subscribe to our channel. Our name is Wills for Life by Dr. Jemima, and that's across all social platforms. Thank you so much for being with us, and may God bless you.